oh, I don't know, a few weeks later, uh, there was a real tragedy of my next door neighbor. My His wife was killed in a tragic um, tractor accident. And that was on a Tuesday in July of 1999. Um, came to work, or came to church rather, on, uh, on Wednesday night after that accident. And after church, I thought, well, I'll, I'll stop by there and check on my neighbor and see how he's doing. And when I went in, um, the, uh, the family was all sitting around a table, and they were, they were planning the funeral. And I said, oh, and I don't want to interrupt. I'll come back later. He said, no, 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 you're just the man I wanted to see. He said, we were talking about the funeral arrangements. He said, would you sing for Susan's funeral? And I said, absolutely. And he said, would you sing that song called Somebody's Praying? Well, that Wednesday night when I was at church, the guy in the sound booth found my soundtrack and gave it to me. So when my neighbor asked if I could sing that song, I had the soundtrack in my pocket when he asked about that, about that song. And I remember uh, standing behind the pulpit when I was singing that song at that funeral, and all of it was crowded, my goodness, there was people everywhere. It was just standing against the walls. And, and I thought, you know, God sure went to a lot of trouble getting this song here right at this particular time. There's a message in this song that somebody in here needs to hear. Maybe it's a person that doesn't normally go to church and they just happen to be at this funeral. Maybe they need to hear this message. Uh, there was some family issues going on, I thought, well, maybe maybe one of the family members really needed to hear this message right at this particular time. For some reason, God had that song at that particular time. And I thought, wow, that's really, that's really something. Uh, that was on a Friday when we had the funeral. The following Friday, we got our phone call that uh, my son's, uh, he was a military pilot, and his plane was shot down, and the whole crew was killed. And I thought about that later, uh, about when I sang a song at that funeral. I thought, you know, I was looking out there to see who needed to hear that song when I should have been looking on this side of the pulpit. You know, I knew God uses people to minister to other people, but I never knew that he used you or us to minister to yourself. And I just feel like that message in that particular song was something that God gave me to kind of prepare for that. Let's share the song with the people, please. Somebody's praying, I can feel it. Somebody's praying for me. Mighty hands are guiding me to protect me from what I can't see. Lord, I believe. Lord, I I believe somebody's praying for me. Angels are watching. I can feel it. Angels are watching over me. There's many miles ahead till I get home. Still I'm safely kept before your throne. Cause Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. Your angels are watching over me. Well, I've walked the barren wilderness 
For my pillow was a stone, and I've been through the darkest taverns where no light had ever shone, and still I went on. For there was someone who was down on their knees. Lord, I thank you for those people praying all this time for me. Somebody's praying, I can feel it. Somebody's praying for me. Mighty hands are guiding me to protect me from what I can't see. Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. Somebody's praying for me. Somebody's praying for me. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and make your way to Mark chapter 10. I don't, don't hardly ever do this. Uh, matter of fact, I don't know if I've ever done this. That's a frightening thought, right? You know, that song, <clears throat> Miss, Miss Doris is the one who kind of put that together and asked, could Ray sing it? He didn't want to. He'd sing it before so many times, he said, and I just looked at him. I said, you're singing that song tonight. I'm not asking. I'm telling you from a good authority, you're going to sing that song tonight. And we, we've all we've kind of laughed and joked about the difference between Sunday morning specials and Sunday night specials. That, you know, someone who maybe can't sing too well, maybe we ought to put them on Sunday night special. And I looked at Ray. I said, I've been wanting to tell you for a long time, you got a Sunday night special. But Ray, that was a Sunday morning special. Great job. Great job. You know, when, when you've been praying for revival and seeking God for revival as, as a church, and I, and I believe you have, I, I hope you have, uh, there's all kinds of things that come up, all kinds of issues, family issues, personal issues, uh, and, and, you know, as he was, was singing that song, I thought, you know, maybe we ought to do something a little bit different tonight. Uh, if you're here, and, and, and listen, if nobody moves, we'll pray and go on. Uh, but, but if you're here and you say, Brother Doug, I need a, a special prayer uh, tonight over me and my family, and uh, maybe it's a child, maybe it's a, I, I don't know, I have no idea, but I'm, I'm going to ask you to do something, and it's going to be very uncomfortable, and so we'll know it's God. Uh, if that's you, will you just come forward, and, and I'll have a time of prayer. I, I want to kind of lay my hand on you and, and pray for you. Is anyone here like that? And say, Brother Doug, I need a special prayer. Hmm. You know, it takes a lot of, a lot of courage to step up in a moment like this, you know. But I think we all could say in some way that we, we need special prayer. We need special prayer. And I know COVID and all has kind of kept us separated, but... Uh, you know, it's time to come together again. It really is. And uh, I'm, I'm so honored that God, God's moved in this way uh, tonight. So we're going to pray over these. And if you'll do something for me, I know, I know we're Baptists. It may be a, a little bit different. Um, but if you're able to do it, will you just kind of extend your hand toward them? And we're going to kind of gather in just a little bit closer here. And I'm going to lay hands on these and, and pray for these who've come. Join me in prayer. Father, I don't know every need around this circle, Lord. I know some. 
And so, Lord, I'm praying that you'd touch them. Lord, I'm praying that you'd heal and restore where that's needed, Father. Uh, Father, there are some here on behalf of family members in need of salvation. And, Lord, there are others here just because they want to see revival in their own life. Lord, I don't know the need. But Father, I know in this moment that you do. And, Lord, as, as a pastor of these folks, Lord, I've got enough sense to go to you in a moment like this. So, Lord, I ask that you'd touch them. Father, I ask that you'd heal where that's needed, comfort where that's needed. Father, we ask also that you would convict where that's needed. Lord, I pray your will in each one of these lives gathered up here in this circle. And, Father, there are others that are seated in chairs that there's issues going on in their life, too. And Lord, I just pray that you would touch every issue, every need in a way that only you can. Father, I'm grateful for these around this circle. Lord, I pray that you touch them and bless them tonight, encourage them tonight through this prayer time and through the message. And it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you all. Thank you all so much for coming. I love you. You know, you got to be careful when you start praying for revival. God will send it. God will do it. But through that, there's a whole lot of other things that's going to happen. Good and bad, and at the end of the day, we know he receives honor and glory for it, so we give it all, all to him. But when you start praying for revival, you start seeking God for revival, and you start really seeing God move in, in individuals' lives. Both the good and the bad happens, and we know that all hell will turn and, and attack uh, if, it's, if it's possible. And, and I, you know, and I'm not saying it's happening necessarily an attack on our church. I don't think that's the way it begins. I think it begins with our families and our homes and our own spiritual walks. Y'all, we're doing so good as a church. I, I just can't think of a complaint. I wish I could, uh, but I, I can't think of a complaint as a church. God's just blessed us, and, you know, we started the Bible school, and we assumed kids would come, but we, but we really didn't know, but we've had a great, great group of kids, and and, and this, this coming Wednesday is Salvation Wednesday, so pray, pray, pray that there'll, there'll be kids that'll receive Christ, and, and that's the ultimate goal of, of every, every Bible school, and, and so God's been so good to us, but I know families going through some issues. Uh, we, we've got families that have uh, children overseas fighting on behalf of this nation, and um, we've got others who have had issues inside their home. Of course, you know, this last week, I think everybody kind of knows we had a, a teenager that ran away and, you know, issues around that. And uh, the teenager's fine was found and taken care of, so everything's good there. But still, you know, it just, things like that seem to happen. And unexplainable things. And when God's moving, those kind of things happen. And we can explain them by spiritual warfare. Now, that's not really the message tonight, but the message tonight is this, that when you begin to pray and you begin to seek God's face, it's not always our way. Not always our way. And I want us to look at kind of what I call a loser in your Bible. If there's ever been a loser in your Bible, I'd say this rich young ruler is absolutely a loser in your Bible, not because of who he is, but because of the, the decision that he makes and I want us to notice, and we'll talk some about salvation. There's absolutely a salvation message here, and I understand that. And y'all know me. I'm an evangelist by heart, and that's, that's my passion. But, but really, not, that's not really the direction I want to take it tonight. I, I want to take it more of, of the revival side and, and God moving. And how he moves is not always the direction that we would expect him to move. So for the next few moments, let's look at the, the story of what we know is the rich the rich young ruler. And I'm going to tell you before we get started, I've got good news. Some scholars believe that the rich young ruler may have possibly been saved later. And there's nothing in our Bible that teaches us that. But historically, they look back and, and believe that they know who it was. And, and maybe they do, maybe they don't. You read your Bible, he's not named. So I don't know who he was. But wouldn't it be great if we got to heaven and he said, yeah, I blew it and got in the scripture on the bad side. But I did trust Jesus. Wouldn't it be great to know that, that, that he... To possibly be in heaven. I choose to believe that at some point maybe he gave his life to Christ. But here he did not. That's why we called him the loser tonight. The Bible says in verse 17 of 
Mark chapter 10. And as he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and he knelt down before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit life? Well, point number one is this, the loser's approach. He had a good approach, right? He comes to Jesus. He comes to Jesus in a good way. The Bible says that he knelt down before him. Now, I, I don't know about you, but if someone comes, let's say on a Sunday morning or even a Sunday night, we had some who came and gathered in this circle and, and, and asked for prayer. If someone comes and they kneel at the feet of the preacher and said, Preacher, I want to know how to go to heaven. We'd say that's a good posture for salvation, wouldn't you? I mean, I would. I would say that's a good posture. It's a good approach. If you're going to approach the Lord Jesus, why not on your knees? That's a good way to do it. By the way, I'm not knocking the way he came. The loser had a good approach. He came to Christ on his knees. Uh, Another gospel says that he comes begging and he comes bowing at the feet of Christ. I think he was pretty serious. I don't think he was messing around. I I think he was willing to get on his face before God. Now, again, we call him the rich young ruler for a reason. He had a lot of stuff. He was a wealthy man. And in that day, much like today, wealthy men don't bow to anyone. They don't cower at anyone's feet. And they certainly don't come running and grabbing and begging, wanting to know. They act like they already know. He's a big shot. This happened in a crowd. This didn't happen off by itself. This happened uh, almost uh, right after he's blessed a group of children. You can see it there in the scripture. And he's been questioned about divorce. So there were Pharisees around. There were religious people around. And this dignified man comes and lays down at the feet of Jesus. He calls him good teacher. He says, I want to know how to be saved he started well you know some churches start well you can read about a church called the church of galatia it's the bible the the book of the bible called galatians and they started well the apostle paul writes to them and tells them in galatians chapter 1 verses 6 through 7 says i'm amazed that you are so quickly turning away from him who called you by the grace of christ and are turning to a different gospel not that there is another gospel But there are some who are troubling you and want to change the good news about the Messiah. Now, the issue was they were coming saying, you can have Jesus, but don't forget about the law. And there's a lot there that we won't go into. But Paul writes and he says, you started so well. I've wondered sometimes if there wouldn't be someone who one day will look back and read the history of Southern Baptists and say, you started so well. Sometimes I wonder if there might be some look at Westside. Baptist and say you started so well you were doing so well how'd you get off track it's easy to get off track isn't it easier to get off track than it is to stay on track there's so much junk out there and good in 2021 all kinds of junk out there there's debates and fusses and fights and we could get into it if we wanted to I choose to just focus on Jesus if that's okay there's a lot of stuff we could debate we could talk about it you know, talking about the, the budget and all this last week and looking ahead. And, and y'all, it's, it's just exciting. What God has just blessed us to be able to, uh, to, to give. And in, in this day, inflation, everything that's going on, we could hoard it up. I mean, it would even make sense to hoard up more than we do to keep it. But that's not what God's called us to do. And so we're having mission committee meetings to figure out how we're going to spend over $100,000 to give it away. Because God has blessed our socks off. And if there's a reason why this church has grown and and done what it's done, it has nothing to do with leadership. It has everything to do with missions and giving and faithfulness of this church body. That's it. That's it. Well, I mean, the preacher ain't half bad, but I mean, that's it. (laughs) That's a joke, y'all. It hasn't got anything to do with the preachers and Sunday school teachers. We got good Sunday school teachers. Paul does a great job. But we all understand it has nothing to do with us. Paul writes to the church at Galatians and says, You started well, but you got off track. The rich young ruler, the loser, has a good approach. He makes a fairly good appeal. He asks him, he says, What must I do to inherit eternal life? It's a good question, isn't it? If you don't know how to go to heaven, it's a good question to want to know. 
It's a good question to come and to ask. He has the right question. I think he's sincere with his question. I think he really wants to know. I think he really sincerely wants to know how, when I die, how can I know that I'm going to go to heaven? There's a lost world out there that uh, some could care less, don't think there is an afterlife, but at the end of the day, there's something nagging at their heart. How can I go and have eternal life? Uh, Blaise Pascal said it's a God-shaped vacuum inside of each person's heart and soul that can only be filled with the heart of God. We try to fill it with drugs and alcohol and sex and television and family and new jobs and new houses and cars and boats and all these things, and yet it can only be filled with God. There seems to be something missing, and the rich young rulers understood something's missing. He's heard the stories of Jesus. If you Look on the timeline of Jesus' life, you'll see that this is getting towards the end. As a matter of fact, if you look through the Gospel of Mark, you'll see very quickly there's going to be a triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem, and that's the beginning of the end of the beginning. That's a long story. We'll talk about that in a moment. So this is getting near the end of his ministry. He's heard of the blind eyes. He's heard of the lame legs. He's heard of everything that Jesus has done. He's also heard that this guy gives eternal life. And he knew he was missing it. This man asked a good question. He, he asked a question that some of us, if not all of us in this room, have, have asked at some point in our lives. And I was very blessed to be raised in a Christian home and ask it as a child, which is so much easier for a child to be saved than it is a senior adult. Not that senior adults can't be saved. We've seen them saved. It's just so much easier. And I'm so grateful that at some point, I started asking those questions, and the Lord Jesus came into my heart. I'm so grateful that he would come into my heart, come into my life, and save this old, dirty, wretched, no-good soul, and not throw him away all these years later. If, there's, if, if, if you could lose salvation, I promise you, I'd have done it ten times over. And yet, he's held me in the grip of his grace. The ruler comes, and he's very sincere but you got to be careful what you ask for. See, he's asking him how to go to heaven. And what he really wanted was his way to heaven. But what he found out was the truth. It reminds me of a story of a man who walked into a restaurant. He had a full-grown ostrich behind him when he walked in the door. I don't know if you've ever seen anyone like that, but they stand out in the crowd. The waitress asked him, for their orders, the man says, a hamburger, fries, and a Coke. Turns to the ostrich and says, what's yours? Ostrich says, I'll have the same. Short time later, the waitress returns with the order and says, that'll be $9.40, please. And the man reaches into his pocket and pulls out the exact change for the payment. Next day, the man and the ostrich come back in. And the man says, I want a hamburger, fries, and a Coke. And the ostrich says, I'll have the same. Again, the man reaches into his pocket and pays with the exact change. This becomes sort of a routine until the two enter again. The usual, the waitress says, no. He said, this is Friday. He said, I'll have a steak, a baked potato, and a salad, the man says. And turns to the ostrich, and the ostrich says the same. Shortly, the waitress brings the order and says that'll be $32.62. Once again, the man pulls in to his pocket and pulls out the exact change and places it on the table. The waitress can't hold back her curiosity any longer, and she says, excuse me, sir. He says, how do you manage to always come up every time with the exact change in your pocket? Well, the man says, several years ago, I was cleaning the attic out, and I found this old lamp. When I rubbed it, a genie appeared and offered, and see, this is where you know it's real. <clears throat> a genie appeared and offered me two wishes. My first wish was that if I ever had to pay for anything, then I could just put my hand in, the po in my pocket and pull out the exact amount of change. It would just always be there. Waitress says, you know, that's brilliant. What was your second wish? Says, well, my, my, my second wish explains the ostrich my second wish was for a chick with long legs who agrees with everything I say <laughs> some of y'all be halfway home and you'll laugh about that that's funny be careful what you ask 
people in Jesus' day had to be very careful with what they asked Jesus. Because if you didn't want to know the truth, you've asked the wrong guy. Jesus turns to this rich young ruler, and he answers him in a way that I never could, nor would I. He turned to him, and he says, why do you call me good? He says, there's, there's no one good but one. God, in verse 18 and 19, he says, verse 19, he says, you know the commandments. He says, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. He said to him, teacher, I have kept all these from my youth this morning after church. Little little Samuel's been asking questions about salvation. And I knew he had. And Paul had told me a few weeks ago, he said, you know, we're going, Samuel needs to talk to you sometime. And and, and I said, well, I, anytime. Be glad to talk to you. But, but when I hear that, I don't go to kids. I kind of wait for kids to, you know, it takes some nerve to come talk to the preacher. And, and, and this morning was the morning. And so after church, they came. And, I, of course, I, I asked him the same thing I asked him. You know, how's, how's school going? How's everything going? And, and I could tell something wasn't right. He needed to talk to the preacher about other things. And we talked about salvation. Now, he didn't pray to be saved. Here he may have when he got home, I don't know, but but he was you know he's asking questions, he's trying to find some answers. With Samuel this morning or this afternoon, by that point, like it is with every kid that comes, they always talk about sin. Now they know what sin is. It's amazing how kids know what sin is, and it's real hard to teach adults sometimes. But kids know what sin is. And I asked him, I said, "Have you ever sinned?" And I'm gonna tell you what he said. He said, "Yeah." And he put his head down. You could tell he was kind of, you know, kind of sad about his sin. And I said, well, what did you do? And, and so he told us. He said, I told my mom I was going to the bathroom at church. And I didn't go to the bathroom. <laughs> he said, I said, what do you call that, Samuel? He said, it's a lie. I said, yeah, it is. And the Bible says that we shouldn't lie. He said, yes, sir, you're right. You see, you need to know that you're a sinner before you meet the Savior. You can't meet the Savior until you know you're a sinner. Now, Samuel's realizing he's not fully understood. I don't think anybody in this room fully understood what sin really was and the depravity that we were under before we met Christ. Can we just be honest about that? I knew I needed Jesus, but I didn't realize. But the longer I walk with him, the more I realize how much of a sinner I am because I've asked him to reveal it, and boy, has he ever. And thank God he has, by the way. See, the rich young ruler came and He wanted Jesus to just say everything's okay. He wanted a Joel Osteen preacher. Y'all ever heard one of those? Everything's going to be all right, man. Come on in. You've earned it. That's, did I say his name? I shouldn't have said his name. But if you watch Joel Osteen, I'll pray for you, all right? I'll pray for you. And that's not what Jesus said. He said, you know the law. And the man lied, didn't he? Now, I didn't mean to lie. I think he meant it when he said, I've kept all those from my youth. As best he knew how, according to the law, he had tried his hardest to keep all those. But who in here has honored your mother and father from the day you were born until now? Not one. Not even little Samuel. He lied to his mother in church. (laughs) I heard him admit it this morning. That's not honoring. You know why he does that? Because of his sin nature. She gave it to him. So we can't get too mad at him. But we can't get mad at her either because it was passed down. We all know Paul's a sinner, right? (laughs) It's handed down. It's a generational curse that we have in this flesh. But Sam's earned it, hadn't he? We all have. The rich young ruler had earned it. He thought he'd earned heaven, but he hadn't. Jesus said, why do you even call me good? That's how he starts it out. Why are you calling me good? Now, why would he say that to the rich young ruler? Uh, Remember, the Pharisees want to kill him. And they ultimately will. And then they won't. Because he won't stay dead. Isn't that something about Jesus? He just won't stay dead. He just (laughs) comes on back. You can't kill a man that's eternal. The ruler wants to know, what have I done right? Not what have I done wrong. 
See, the issue is not the goodness of man. The issue is the goodness of God. Because when we measure ourselves up to God, we all know we fall short of that standard. That's why Jesus looks at him and says, don't call me good. There's only one good, and that's the Father. See, that's the standard. It's not Moses' law. It's the standard of the holiness of God. Ruler doesn't get it, so he lies. And he says, teacher, I've kept all these from my youth. The Bible says something odd in verse 21. It says, he looked at him. Jesus loved him. Isn't that good? He loved him. Don't miss it in the story. He loved him. He wasn't mad at him. He didn't want to shake him. He, he, he didn't want to hurt him. He, didn't, he wasn't glad that he wouldn't receive him. He wasn't excited that he would go to hell because of his sin. He looked at him and he loved him. The word in the Greek means he literally, he just felt sympathy for him. He had compassion on him. Why? Because his mind was so depraved that he thought he's good enough to go to heaven. Well, how do you look at lost folks? I'm, I mean, the ones who say, I, I don't need that junk, that garbage. I don't need to go to church. I don't, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. Sure does help. No, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. I know that. I stood in a, y'all, this sounds like an oxymoron, but it's not, a service department at a Chevrolet dealership. <laughs> I'm saying that, and there's men in this room who know my truck. Tuesday morning, I went out to get in it and turn and nothing happened. Y'all, that's not good. So what do you do? You turn it back. And, and at 6.30 a.m., before I've had enough coffee, it's not good. But I did go get in another Chevrolet and go to the prayer breakfast anyway. That's another story. It wasn't the Chevrolet that quit. It was the battery. It's hard, it's hard to admit you're wrong. It's hard to admit you've failed. It's hard to admit you can't do it on your own. And as hard as it was for the Pharisees to do it, it's that much harder for an American. You know, we're the ones who, we, we broke free, man. We fought our way to freedom. We took it. That's who we are. We're the ones that when you, when you take out your dollar bills, it says, in God, we trust. That's who we are. And we're going to die and go to hell without Jesus. Thinking we're good enough to make it. Jesus looks at him and says, why do you call me good? Your standard is not the law. Your standard is the holy God that's above the law. By the way, it always has been. That's why the law couldn't do it. That's why he had to send Jesus. The Bible says he loved him. He cared for him. And y'all, as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are called to love lost people in spite of lost people. They don't know. They're blind. But praise God, we've seen some with their eyes open. Man, one sang this morning. <laughs> Every time she sings, I just, I just think of, man, God's so good. God's so good. There are others in this room that I've seen. I saw you pre-Christ and I've seen you post-Christ. And I like you post-Christ better than pre-Christ. It's better, isn't it? Yeah, he does too. And you like him better too, don't you? Yeah, it's better with Jesus. Jesus looked at him and he loved him. He had compassion. But he had to tell him the truth. You know this story. You lack one thing. He said, go sell everything you have. And give to the poor. Now, when I was a kid growing up, we used to hear preachers stand behind the pulpits just like this one and, and, and make the statement, that's what he asked him to do, but he would never ask us to do that. Now, as a kid, I always thought that was odd, but it made sense. I mean, why would God ask us to give up everything we own for him? That doesn't make sense. That doesn't make sense. But at the end of the day, he may very well ask someone in this room tonight to sell everything you have. Don't, don't leave that out of the equation. Now, I understand that's not the point of the message tonight, but if that's what he's called you to do as a Christian, sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and follow him. You say, but Brother Dub, 
If that's what he's called you to do, now you better be sure he called you to do it. But if he has, do it. Why, why would we in Baptist churches tell Baptist people that God would never do what he's done before when he says, I am the Lord thy God and I do not change? That's a scary thing we've had preachers in pulpits making statements like that. You know why they make statements like that? Keeps the job. People get real shook up and get sideways. You start telling them that God might call you to sell everything you have and give to him. By the way, it's his anyway. If he hasn't called you to sell it all, he's called you to submit it all. Jesus says, sell everything you have. Give it to the poor. He said, if you do that, you have treasure in heaven. Now, he's working his way to heaven, right? No. He's saying, if you're willing to submit to that, then you have submitted to my lordship. He said that knowing the outcome. You know why it's Jesus. That's why I don't make statements like that. I'm not Jesus. The Bible says, then come follow me. But then it says, but he was stunned. Literally, it, 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 it's the idea of gloominess. He, he had this weightiness that just hit him all of a sudden. See, he's thinking he's good up to this point. And then Jesus says to sell everything. Well, that's what he lived for. I can't get rid of everything I live for. And the Bible says that he became gloomy, despondent, stunned is the way this translation translates it. He's kind of in shock, but it's worse than that. It's a state of depression as he walks away without Jesus. He wanted him, and he wanted salvation, but, but not really. See, he wanted Jesus to say, everything's going to be okay. The disciples wanted Jesus to say, I am going to set up a new kingdom. We're going to overthrow Rome. We're going to set up a kingdom right here right now but that's not what he said when Jesus moves he doesn't always move in the way that we expect him to move and it's not even in the way that we desire him to move because when he moves we have to change and we're not real good with that change is never easy I promise you there is nobody in this room that hates change worse than I do I like knowing what time I'm going to get up what time my Bible study is going to be exactly when I'm going to get those 12 cups of coffee plus, then what am I going to do? I like to know what's coming. And every week, every week, there's at least one day where nothing happens the way I had planned it. And I don't like that day of the week. I never know when it's coming. It'll hit you out of the blue, won't it? Well, I mean, I got a big day planned. I'm going to get all this done. And at the end of the day, you ever, you ever had a day like that? At the end of the day, you go, I didn't do anything I planned to do. I did a lot, but I didn't do anything I planned to do. I don't like for anything to change my plans. But boy, it sure is worth it when it's God. The rich young ruler just walked away. Man, he's just sad. He didn't want to change anything. He didn't want to do anything different. Someone has said that the most exhausting thing in life is being insincere. He was sincere at the beginning, but man, at the end, he just, he couldn't get over the hump. He just couldn't do it. What in the world would... God had done for him if he had just said, you got it. You got it. Do you know where I can get a good for sale sign? Because I'm selling the castle tonight. Uh, God would have blessed him. That's not what he does. He walks away sorry. I think King James translates that sorrowful, gloomy, down, and despondent. Then the next verse. Jesus looked around, and he said to his disciples. Now, don't, the, the, the imagery in the, in the New Testament is wonderful. The man comes up, and he disrupts everything that's happening, and Jesus turns. It's as if his disciples no longer exist. He's talking to one guy, and he tells him, he says, man, why well, you call me good? Only one good, and that's the Father. And he said, you know what the Scripture says. And don't lie, cheat, steal, don't do those things. I've done all of that. He said, okay, go sell everything you have. Come follow me. You have treasure in heaven. And the guy walks away. And Jesus looks around the crowd. It's as if he's looking for someone who would be willing to do it. And he turns back to his disciples and he says, how hard is it for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God? 
Man, I've seen this firsthand in places like Africa and South America, Chile, Temuco, Chile, to be exact, just outside of town, the Mapache people. The, the, the word Mapache literally means white trash in their culture. They hate them. They hate them. They give them these reservations to live on, and they're scum of the earth. Well, that's who we went to reach. And you walk into a little hut with no running water, nothing. I mean, they have nothing. And you tell them about a Savior, you can take them to heaven. Heaven seems better than here. I'd like to do that. They believe. They don't kind of believe, but they believe. And you don't have to take them to church planting school to know you need other believers to meet with. They just start meeting. They just start meeting. They'll have some old out-of-tune guitar with somebody who can't carry a tune in a bucket with a lid on it. And they'll walk in there and they'll sit in a little hut about half the size of this row, maybe three rows there. And they'll put over 100 people stuffed in there, shoulder to shoulder, as uncomfortable as it can be to worship the Lord Jesus. When we went, we had a pastor go through the floor of one of the churches. And they don't have to have air conditioning and lights and sound system and all those things that America has to have. You know why? Because they have a need. They have a need, and only Jesus can fill it, and they know it. America is the latest seeing church of the day. We've got everything we need. And Jesus on the outside looking in, knocking on the door, and saying, Yeah, but you've missed me. You miss me. The Bible says that the disciples were astonished at his words. I may as well turn my notes off. I hadn't looked at them but once. <laughs> he was astonished. At, they were astonished at his words. And Jesus said to them, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. They were more astonished and they said, then who can go? Who can be saved? And Jesus said, with men it is impossible but with God, not with God, because all things are possible with God. Peter began to tell him, look, we left everything to follow you. And Jesus said, I assure you, there is no one who has left house, brothers or sisters, mother or father, children or fields because of me and the gospel who will not receive a hundred times more. Now at this time, houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children and fields with persecution and eternal life in the age to come. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. I'd say across the church, the world church, the global church, I would say America's probably right up at the top. Man, we, we, you, you name it, what, what do we not have? If, if you want better music, well, you can go to a church and find better music. If you want a better sermon than the church you've been going to, you go to another one and find a better sermon, someone who can articulate better, someone who can go deeper in the Word. It's, it's easy to find. Church on every corner in most places in America. Not all places, but most places. I'd say the Bible Belt's right up at the top of affluency. And we've got mega churches. If you don't want mega churches, we've got medium mega churches. And then if you don't like that, then we've got small churches. And then we've got churches of every different stage in between. You want a mom and pop church? I can take you to some. You want a family run church? We can go to some of those. You want a church that's just big enough to get lost in the crowd? We can go to those. You want a church with contemporary music? We got them. Traditional music, I had someone tell me not too long ago that if we'd ever, if we'd learn how to sing the right music, this would be a good church. I said, I'll talk to Paul. <laughs> you, you don't like my translation of the Bible? We can find a pastor with a different translation. What, what translation do you like? NIV? I can take you to one that preaches out of the NIV. You, you like King James? King James don't? I can take you to one of those. No problem. You name it. You know what I want? A church that will follow Jesus. That's it. That's it. I've got my preference of song. And, I, and I've got to be honest, what we do is pretty much hits my preference somewhere in the middle. Some of the old, some of the new. 
Dawson told me, he said, you'd like our worship at chapel. He knows I like a little peppier music, little rock and roll type music. I do. There's a song that's out right now called It's About to Get Loud, and it's talking about their worship. And I, I, I like that song. We probably won't ever sing that song here, but I like it. <laughs> Dawson, said, Dawson said in chapel, he said, we sing that song in chapel. And I said, I'm coming to chapel one day. <laughs> We've got to remember, we don't get revival in the move of God on our time in our way. It happens in God's time. You, you, and you don't get to dictate when he does what he does. Don't you wish you could? It doesn't work like that. And we say we want revival, but the way we may get it is he may tell you to change. He may call you to preach. Not one amen. Amen. <laughs> He may call you to teach the Sunday school class that we need a teacher in. He may call you to give up your Sunday school class and go sit in the nursery on Sunday. We have a need for that. I really do. Now, I don't know what God's going to do, but I know if you walk in disobedience or whatever it is, we'll never as a church see revival or the rest of us will see it. And you'll miss out. You'll walk around gloomy and, and depressed and down just like this ruler. Who said, man, I, can't, I just can't do it. I'm holding on to my stuff. Now, I'm not going to give it up. Wouldn't that be sad? That's even sad to say out loud that we could have revival and people here miss it. But we can we can, but if we want to see God move the way we really need to see God move in this community, we got to all say as best we know how we're following King Jesus. If he were here, you wouldn't tell him no. Well, he's here. He's here. He, I said it this morning. You can't see the Spirit, but you can see where it's been. Isn't it good when you walk out of church and say, he's been here. He's been here. You almost smell the aroma of Jesus. He's here. The question is not, is he here? And the question is not, will he move? The question is, what will we do with what he's telling us to do? Remember the song we used to sing a long time ago? Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be what? Happy. In Jesus, but to trust and obey. I know it's Sunday night. I know that. But God sent revival on Sunday night too. And I want J.J. Jasper to show up from Tupelo, Mississippi and walk in and say, God's here. I don't want him to bring God. I want him to show up and meet with him in this place. I want us to go out and get lost folks to come and hear about Jesus, and I'm praying that happens. I want him to be on the radio and get people in from this area, and that's going to happen. But when they come in the room, I want a different presence in this room. And y'all, I'm just going to be honest. I feel it every time we come together. <laughs> I do. What's he calling you to do? If he's talking, you better be listening. Or we'll, you, you'll miss it. Revival will sweep through this place and pass you by. Man, don't let him pass you by. Get in on it. I'm telling you, there's no peace like Jesus' peace. To know. And I know we all got stuff going on. We had a big circle, didn't we? We all got, but God knows what we need. He'll fill it in his time. Trust him. You can. You can trust him. Let's bow for prayer. But Paul's going to come. We'll have a time of invitation. and We'll open up the altars in the same way we did at the beginning. And if you need to come, you come. We'll pray together.
If the Lord's dealing with your heart, oh man, if he's calling you to be saved, trust him. You can trust him. He died for you. He lives for you. You can be saved this night. If he's calling you to preach, won't you come forward in just a moment and tell us? Maybe he is. If he's calling you to teach, maybe you need to come. Say, I don't know where I'm supposed to teach, but God's calling me. God's a big God. He may be calling you to missions. He, he may be telling you tonight, I want you to surrender to missions. It may be local missions. It may be overseas missions. If that's what he's calling you to do, why not tonight? Don't put it off. You'll never, you'll never be happy in Jesus without obedience. Maybe you won't come and kneel on the altar and just pray for revival. I don't know. Whatever God's dealing with your heart, I just pray that you'd answer with a yes. Father, we love you. We praise you. Thank you for the night. Continue to speak in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. If you need to come, you come as we sing. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart, you're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you. to rise to you when temptation comes my way when I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay and when I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I Lord, I need you, oh, I need you, every hour I need you, my one defense, my righteousness, oh, God, how I need you, teach my song. So teach my song to rise to you When temptation comes my way When I cannot stand, I'll fall on you Jesus, you're my hope and stay Lord, I need you Oh, I need 
This morning we had a video and we planned to show on behalf of Dixie Jackson the state uh, offering and your preacher forgot it we were going to show it tonight but your preacher preached too long and I'm not going to hold you at, at hostage bay uh, tonight to show you that video but I'm, I am going to tell you this it yeah yeah it's online you can go watch it that way we, we, we'll show you another video uh, coming up but this is the week of prayer for Dixie Jackson uh, which is our state missions uh, offering. They've asked that today, this Sunday, if you haven't if you haven't picked up prayer guide, please do that. But they've asked today to begin the week of prayer for Dixie Jackson, Arkansas missions offering by asking God to ignite a vision in your heart for your role in Arkansas missions. Ask God to use your daily faithfulness to open pathways for the word to spread in your community. You know that's a good prayer. And God will just use us to spread the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so you do that today. Ask him to. Ask him to start your week off in that way. Ask him to send you somebody who doesn't know Christ uh, that they might hear the gospel. You know everything that's happening this week. Uh, when, when fall hits, it gets busy. Y'all know that. It is what it is. Uh, if, um, if you're a man and you haven't signed up for the men's uh, retreat that starts this Friday, uh, I need you to do that tonight before you leave, if you know you're going, and uh, that way I can let them know a number. They just need to know a number for food uh, ahead of time, and so we need to get that done. Uh, if you're here tonight, you know you're going, and you hadn't signed up, please sign up and let me know that you're going. Uh, but if you're praying about it, and you still need a few more days, you got to Wednesday, all right? I got to let them know before Wednesday. And if you decide on Friday you're going, let me know. I can work it out, all right? But I, <laughs> it'd be nice to know ahead of time. So, uh, so you be sure and, and sign up for that. A lot of stuff going on. Be in prayer for this weekend, uh, this next weekend. We're praying for God to move among our men and uh, for God to use that as a catalyst for revival for the next weekend. And so uh, praying for that. Anyway, everything else that's going on, thank you so much for coming tonight. We've had great Sunday night crowds. Thank you for coming. If you're a guest with us tonight, we have a few. We hope you'll come back and worship with us very, very soon. Brother Jerry McCarty, will you dismiss us in a word of prayer, please?